The summer's gone and I have to admit some really unflattering truths about my blind buys that I did specifically for summer in the spring. And the gloves are coming off. Hi friends, I'm Marie Meliora. Welcome to my channel. Today we're gonna talk about perfume fails. Some of these, not some, all of these. Yeah. All of these were blind buys and that's probably the most common source of my uh, fragrance disappointments. Even though majority of the perfumes I buy blindly, I fully accept responsibility for liking or not liking them because that's the whole point of a blind buy, you want to be surprised. Unfortunately, a lot of these fall uh, for me into the category of kind of comfort perfumes, affordable jams summery florals and things like that. I bought most of these specifically to be worn during the late spring and summer and I haven't done so, almost none. I tried to wear them every once in a while and absolutely loathed the experience. So let's start from an unlikely, an unlikely candidate in my fragrance fails because some of you who've watched my L'Artisan Perfumer collection know how much I appreciate and love this brand, but the Onde Sensuelle is just not, just not working for me. Essentially, this is from a explosions of emotions, if I'm translating it correctly, uh, line uh, from L'Artisan Parfumeur, they all came out in this shape factor of bottles. Now some of them are being slowly, those that are not discontinued, they're being reformulated, kind of like is shipped into their usual bottles. So the On De Sensuelle, uh, the whole line was created by Bertrand de Chafour, who is probably one of the great masters of contrasting or unusual juxtapositions of notes while keeping uh, overall composition fairly full of air and kind of breathing. Very, the, his perfumes are very, usually very full of breath. They are not heavy, not, they're not cloying, they're not too dense. The Onden Sensuelle in its essence is a combination of some metallic notes or something of that kind, maybe something azonic, with caramel and pear. I bought it specifically because of the notes. I thought that's a really cool, cool combination of factors, you know, caramelized pears. I think that sounds pretty cool. However, I fooled myself into forgetting that I loathe caramel accord. Almost, it's almost exclusively because it's so overused in the mass market perfumery and like in the so-called designer perfumery, even though like at this point we have to admit most of it is just as crappy as things you can buy in CVS for six bucks, with notable exceptions. So yes, I'm like, I'm very judgy, I know. The, it, it, it does deliver on the promise, I just don't like this type of milky caramel with pear. It's just not my cup of tea, but I find that this type of caramel perfume is probably the most wearable in the summer because of these kind of like high-pitched metallic, somewhat floral notes. And the combination of pear and caramel make it really flirtatious, if you wish. And the whole line is actually devoted to different stages of love or different kind of moments in a love affair. I do appreciate the make. The blend is really high quality. It's just not my, it's not just, these are not my notes, if you wish. I'm gonna be putting out on Mercari, eBay, oh, and Facebook page. Facebook page shop is gonna be a little bit cheaper because they have lower fees. Um, next one. It's like a whole cohort. This is just upsetting to me because this is almost... <sighs> Let me just show you what it looks together. It's like a pink galore. Like, I, I feel like this would make a perfect Instagram-worthy kind of vanity table composition, but I'm very upset because all of them I bought almost together and it represents these four fragrances 
could easily afford me a Frederick Mall bottle, which I would probably prefer quite strongly. The first one is Aqua Allegoria by Guerlain, and this is Rosa Pop. I was looking for a uh, truthful representation. Let me remove the old blotter. Truthful representation of wild uh, rose bushes. You know, not the not the Holland dyes kind of like not the Holland roses that are big, thick, and oily, and not the Bulgarian rose, but th the wild roses, like the small little ones that you can find just growing naturally. And Rosa Pop was rumored to be one of the perfect watercolory light flirtatious, you know, like perfect just eau de toilette kind of thing that you would just spray all over and enjoy the, the flare. I must say, it's just too synthetic to me, to me. There's something in here that just reeks flat. I'm sure it may probably open differently on different skins and on, for different noses, but I'm sure all of all of you understand this feeling when you take a perfume, you smell it, and you're just like, ooh. It's like something that was, it seems like somebody bought a ton of laundry detergent and you know distilled the odorants that were put in it that are called rose. It's just really not working for me. And to be honest, I'm getting more and more disappointed with new releases in the Aqua Allegoria line. They used to be a, almost an epitome of colognes and like floral notes. Like they were the originals Jo Malone, if you wish. But as the gear progress, I kind of find that these compositions are less and less deep, le less and less fluffy. Like they just fall so cheap and so flat. Like, like simple odorants that you would put in a dish soap. But for those of you who care about kind of like this wild rose bushes, kind of like English garden style, um, it does have that accord, no doubt. But if you, like if I am really looking for something that would be like right in terms of the olfactory profile and right in terms of price, I already have tea, tea rose by the designer workshop. They are the same guys who make uh, Amur, Amurud uh, line of perfumes. This is to me, a little bit even more realistic, if you wish, like a little bit more zesty with a little bit more punch. And it costs, I don't know, 10, 20 dollars for like 120 mil. This is, this is really a lot of perfume. And then lately I've been obsessed putting it on my towels. Oh, I love it so much. Like every time I get out of the shower and my towel smells of this, oh, so good. So I just don't see a point since I already have a cheaper and to me better alternative to keep the, the Guerlain because I find, well, maybe somebody will appreciate, I mean, the bottle is nicer. Let's just face the facts. And certain people collect Aqua Allegorias. They are very collectible. They look really nice put together. And I know that there is like a whole cohort of people who genuinely love uh, Rosa Pop in the kind of the light floral compositions from this line. So I hope, I hope somebody will take it off my hands and enjoy it more. The next one is the least similar flanker of Mont Guerlain by Guerlain. This is Bloom of Rose. Um, again, a rosy perfume, specifically, I think it was really specifically for spring. This one is sweeter. If I had to compare them, the Mongerland Bloom of Rose versus Aqua, Aqua Allegoria Rosa Pop, these are more, a little bit watery, a little bit more fresh type of rose scent. This is more flirtatious, sweeter, by that I mean sweeter, with that typical Etil Maltol note that so many people love in La Vie Belle, but it's kind of subdued. It, it only supports the, uh, the, the, the rosy floral, kind of very pop of pink kind of um, note. 
but I do like if I'm really talking about this kind of like glamour magazine like glossy magazines type of flavor I already have uh, Pink Pop by Stella McCartney. To me, this is the epitome of like glossy magazines and I don't need a second kind of representation of that. As a fragrance itself, I find it again flat, kind of synthetic, disappointing. It's just doesn't really contain the beauty of of morning rose. There are so many perfumes that claim to have morning rose, right? Like white rose, morning rose, rose bushes. And to me, this is this is not it. Even though it's charming. Like these both perfumes smell nice, right? Like no designer, no perfumes in the designer category smell appalling. All of them are something floral, fruity, sweet, blah, blah, blah. It's just, I have 200 plus bottles in my collection. I have everything. I have difficult, complex, dimensional, charming, simple, flirty, this, 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 that. And during the whole summer, I had these two bottles and I had to force myself to use them. So I'm just, I'm just looking at this collection and realizing that I have a horrible luck blind buying designer perfumes. Not that the, they are in any way worse than niche, but I guess with niche, I'm maybe more picky because it's more expensive and therefore kind of the proportion of success is higher there. But with designer perfumes, man, I suck. I really suck at blind buying designer perfumes. Here's another example, Kenzo. This is Kenzo Amour Make Me Fly, which is a very different approach to a summery, pink, flirtatious perfume. Here we have some, as they claim, variation of a sweet poppy flower with rice powder. So even here they do add those somewhat aquatic, light, white musky kind of notes. The heart and the base of it is very mm, demure rice powder. But if you have to compare something that contains this kind of... I'm sure you know like the, the smell of the rice powder or, or like rice pudding and things like that. The rice can give this very subtle, intimate sweetness to uh, you know a meal or to a olfactory creation. But if I really had to choose a rice powder heavy perfume, I would go with Jill Sander. That, let me bring it here actually. Here it is. So this is a Jill Sander Simply Poudre. It's a flanker of their Simply line. And here, the rice powder is more appropriately wrapped in my like in, in the way that it makes it shine. It's a little bit more powdery, a little bit more irisy, like the iris gives often this uh, impression of kind of old makeup bag smell. It's somewhat dusty, somewhat powdery. And that, that's the kind of rice powder perfume that I really love. While Make Me Fly by Kenzo, it's just, again, falls flat. It's a little bit contrasting, not in a flattering fashion for me with those light kind of azonic, somewhat synthetic notes. They don't really translate like they have a lot of dimension with the rice powder and the sweetness. It's just me, it's just me. The next one is the Salvador Dali Sun and Roses. Since I had such good luck with Sun and Sea in Caracas, I thought that a rosy scent by Salvador Dali sounds like a great idea. This is kind of like more like pumple mousse, kind of like pumple rose uh, type of synthetic combination. It, it kind of transitions between peony, rose, raspberry, and something in between. But again, to me, this is falls very flat. It gives me the same impression of kind of like bathroom refreshener kind of odorant rather than a perfume composition and you see like as we it's, let me just show you like how many of these i bought specifically for this summer and spring and almost 100 percent of these things became an utter disappointment this is kind of sad, isn't it? it and, and we're not done yet. We're not even done yet. So the next 
designer disappointment is it's even in the it's original box elizabeth arden mediterranean not gonna lie i bought it partially because i was fascinated with this whole mediterranean theme in perfumes back in the in the early spring and i and i still love it but i have much better versions than this and the bottle the only thing that surprised me that it doesn't have a name of the perfume it's just it almost looks generic because there's no branding on it whatsoever uh, the plastic silver lid could be better not gonna lie but I do love sort of aesthetics of the of the shape of the ball and of its beautiful kind of like warm blue color so Mediterranean uh, was a early 2000s creation if I'm not mistaken and to me it just doesn't really go where a lot of modern niche perfumes go when it comes to a feel of the beach this is way too timid way too commercial for it to really bear such a honorable name as Mediterranean modern perfumes that are about the beach or something swampy you know like something uh, green hot humid modern modern niche and actually if, if you think of it even Laguna by Salvador Dali does a better job of representing that kind of feel c compared to Mediterranean it does have some hints of those somewhat salty kind of mineral notes so-called ocean breeze but it has so much typical Elizabeth Arden fruity floral sweetness that it just loses any character and as much as I appreciate the visual here it's just boring to me this is a boring perfume so another disappointment um, and yet another designer perfume that I just kept trying to fall in love with and I can't this is a newly reformulated insolence by Guerlain. This is Eau de Toilette. A lot of people say that the old insolence, which was an individually shaped kind of, those kind of discs, some like half spheres nested together, that that was truly the most magnificent powdery violets. It turns out I'm not a big fan of the violets as an accord. And after they got reformulated a lot of people say that the the scent became simpler flatter but in some way more accessible i took it as a go buy it sign when i heard accessible because because i thought you know i don't really like violets maybe i should kind of step by step get introduced to to them through something that is a little bit more mass market, a little bit like wider appeal, a little bit simpler and easier to understand. Epic fail, as much as I love the bottle design. I love that the Guerlain brought these bottles back and kind of unified the packaging of their main line because to be honest, I'm not a big fan of their old packaging. It was kind of cheap in my view. This has way more stylistic appeal and kind of luxury feel to it. But the juice, mm -mm -mm. no, screaming, annoying, flat again. If if somebody made a laundry detergent with Violet's name on it, I would say that oh, that's not that bad. So maybe it could be used on towels. But at this point, how many fragrances do I have to use on towels? Way too many. I don't have that many towels in my life. Uh, so I, I just hope that maybe somebody who loves violets and who's looking for a lighter, more cheerful, I guess, version of just uh, eau de toilette, something that just spray and run out of the door, maybe. Bottle is definitely cool. I love the bottle. This is Yuzu Yamamoto. I'm not going to disturb you. Uh, femme, so version for women. I find that most perfumes by this brand are truly unisex, so you don't, I wouldn't even pay attention to like the marketing, men, women, if I were you, just find something that fits your olfactory need better. So this is basically one of those Juliet has a gun, not a perfume type of perfumes. 
it's uh, in a very, very similar vein as many of the molecule perfumes and all of those kind of like modern creations that don't follow any old this like fragrance wheel categorization you know oriental florals shipper fougere none of that it's just quiet nudie very much base centric perfume that gives you a just an aura of calmness it doesn't really have movement it doesn't really have much of anything but oddly enough that's that that rings very organic with Japanese culture and what they stand for at least in the in the global mainstream of cultural influence I wore it with great pleasure I wore down half of the bottle until my collection exploded and now I just have perfumes that are I find way more interesting to me for example I do prefer watercolor but bright vibrant and contrasting that i can find in l'artisan parfumeur even though these are also mostly lighter perfumes i prefer it to these kind of formulations of perfume without a perfume it has this very warm kind of cashmere slight echo of a tonka bean and tobacco in such a quiet meditative way that I'm kind of like as I'm talking about I'm falling back in love with it but it's just too quiet for me so this is definitely a perfume to be just like to put in your purse if you are the kind of person who hates strong smells that you but at the same time every once in a while you want some feeling of comfort without really studying notes or smelling anything in particular this is one of those like cashmere sweaters in perfumery so a half of a bottle I would love to find a second home for it because it's, it's good stuff for its category as every blog, blog, blogger I'm constantly on the hunt for budget-friendly replacements or high quality smell inexpensive kind of juices that would cost like a dime so for that reason and for its historic significance i bought emerald by coty oldie but a goodie if you go to fragrance net and read the reviews first of all this fragrance has probably surprisingly even though fragrance net is not exactly fragrantica it's not really a place for socializing but you'll find dozens if not hundreds of reviews on on emerald and most of them will be saying something like that I remember the early 1943 when I was just young I just came out of the college and I met the love of my life it was my high school sweetheart and ever since then it's been 50 years since we're married and I still love wearing that perfume this is the kind of memories and the kind of legacy that this inspires it basically was the Shalimar you know like the expensive French perfume for the people who were, were a working class from the best sense of that word people who worked at the factories people who were building the country very simple packaging extremely simple but like there's a reason for it right like it was mass produced it was something that anybody could afford uh, from like a broke student to a manager in the white collar job so emerald is following Shalimar footsteps but with a different slightly different uh, style so they combine this sparkly acidic citrusy notes with the heart and the, the background of vanillin it's not even vanilla I would call it vanillin it's kind of edible type of vanilla I do find this to be really charming as a room scent but in the sense of a modern perfumery this is a bit outdated and very cheap I could easily see how this could grow on me in the in the years of deficit in the years of when little was either accessible or affordable and as a kind of poor folk Shalimar I do actually prefer it to Shalimar there is a Shalimar um, eau de cologne or Shalimar, Shalimar cologne I 
absolutely loathed it and that's probably the closest version to this but that one to me smelled cheaper more stringent and and almost less cohesive and my rod does a decent job at blending though cheap but blending those cheap ingredients in a very smooth fashion the citrusy refreshing notes don't break away and don't conflict with the sweetness of the base they mostly just wrap together into this kind of like uh, sour sweet shake I like it for what it represents and what it means and even what it is but I'm not gonna wear it as a personal perfume so this is mostly like a study to understand the history of perfumery and to understand the history of how uh, generations, our grandmothers, mothers, what affected their olfactory senses and therefore affected us. But I really wish there was like some kind of like competition run by Coty when like modern, hot, popular perfumers would create their tribute to Emerald, but with modern ingredients, with a little bit more higher budget to make this deeper, more interesting, add more twists to it. Because I do find this to be the smell of a generation or maybe several generations. It's just not crafted well enough by the modern standards. Two travel sizes by Van Cleef and Arpels, their exclusive line that I love so much because they make this exactly the type of perfumes that I gravitate towards. You know, nudie, subtle, soft, complex, but yet non-intrusive, non non-offensive by any means. Like, they are stay, steer clear from beast mode, kind of like the perfume enters before you do. And I thought that they could do no wrong. Apparently they can. <laughs> so I tried two of their perfumes here. This is Amber Imperial. This is exactly the kind of amber I don't like, unfortunately. In the without a fail, every perfume that follows this recipe, I'll explain what it is, is just undoubtedly fell in my collection. So this is the kind of fruity type of amber. Uh, the, to me, it's like this one of those, like, the cheapest type of amber cord you can buy, I presume, because all, I meet it the most commonly in cheap amber perfumes. That is peachy, apricot jammy, sugary kind of amber. And unfortunately, Amber Imperial, to me, falls into that category. It's this you know, peach jam, apricot jam type of amber. It almost goes into like kind of like apricot hard candy, if you wish, that was boiled for a long time. Just not it. If you like Elizabeth Taylor, Black Pearl, Casimir by Chapard, there's like a number of them that have that kind of fruity amber accord, you might like the Amber Imperial more because it's definitely a step up in terms of the quality of the blend. But it's just not my kind of amber. Like that's, that's not, that has like zero, if not negative appeal to me. The second one is, what I like more is just, I can't quite see myself wearing it to the end. And this is Moonlight Patchouli. This is very elegant, mineral, stony kind of approach to the green and zesty uh, accord of patchouli. And this is why I find it to be a little bit hard to wear. It's just very melancholic. And I do find that majority of fragrances that have moon, moonlight, luna, uh, these, these references to the moon in their name, like almost guaranteed not to like them. Not because the, they're bad. For example, I would go as far as call these kind of approaches, you know, like hot pink, cheap synthetic rose fragrances. I f I'm rather, f I find them to be bad, though it's not bad in terms of smell. These kind of like very melancholic, cold, stone-like, 
sad, depressing kind of perfumes, I find there is a certain beauty in it, just in the in, a, in some kind of literature of that kind. It's like Sylvia Plath poem in a bottle, if you wish. It's just not what I like to wear. I like the perfume to give me different emotions <laughs> from depression. It's just, i almost never in the mood for it, that's what I'm trying to say. But I do appreciate the make and the uniqueness of, of the Moonlight Patchouli by uh, Van Cleef and Arpels. So I think I will just put them up for grabs together. If anybody is interested in trying the exclusive line by Van Cleef and Arpels, you can get them in the factory, um, in the factory packaging. And the last one that we're going to talk about today is my recent niche purchase, which a surprise failure. By all the descriptions of the perfume, I was ought to like it. And this is uh, Lauren Mazzoni, or so-called Alain Parfums, Eau de Soupirs. I heard it compared to certain Mona di Oreo perfumes, and since I'm such a sucker for historic niche houses and Mona Dioria, she is like the golden daughter of Edmund Rudnitska and she has this beautifully tragic personal history, you know, like kind of like Van Gogh in perfumery. She is like the one who died too young and you know, and yada 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 and her perfumes are revered, you know, like a writer for writer. So Mona Dioria is kind of me deemed to be a perfumer for perfumers. A lot of experts in the industry adore her creations. She's no longer with us. So when I heard the comparisons of Eau de Soupirs by Lauren Mazzoni uh, or Lamper Femmes with Mona Dioria, I thought, okay, I gotta get this, I gotta get this. Luckily for me, I found this on Mercari, I think, for a fairly affordable price, you know, it was under hundred dollars, let's, let's just keep it there. Um, and yet, the only thing that I smell here is a sweet wood polish. You know, like sometimes you can buy those uh, pressured cans that you spray to polish wood surfaces or any kind of, yeah, like mostly wood surfaces, like some kind of, it, it's, it combines these odd notions of wood lacquer, cleaning supplies, something that is used to repair musical instruments. Honestly, I'm a bit at loss. It is ambery as it's promised and somewhat musky, but I can't get past this central kind of like workshop, wood, wood workshop kind of note that I can't quite pinpoint. It just doesn't really work on my skin and it doesn't work with my nose. So I tried it on the skin, I tried it like on clothing, I tried it just in the air and I can't get past, past that note. But that in a way, what makes it unusual and interesting. So I think at this point, it's just the open question of whether it will fit your olfactory preferences. For me, unfortunately, it's a, it's a flop and I didn't even wear it that much because I just couldn't. I just really don't like the, the, the smell of it. it. And that's as simple as that, which for me is fairly rare. I usually can find something that I appreciate about a perfume that I will at least give it somewhere. In this case, I just can't, you know, like it's just on, on organic, on like a very carnal level. I just don't, don't like the smell. Yep, here is the whole collection of failures. I can't believe just how much money it does represent, but I guess that's the, the cost of the game. For like every lucky blind buy, every once in a while you get like a dud. And dud purely in the sense of, you know, me liking, not liking it. Um, I tried to give you as honest, as precise of an opinion as I could to help you kind of navigate the space. If you know that you love what I hate or you love what you love, that will give you somewhat a direction. But ultimately, you know, the decision is yours. I'm just showing you what is very, what is eager to find a second home for a very affordable price. So 
please visit my page and let me know if you want to support me getting a new niche bottle for you for review by buying something in my collection that no longer has a place. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, please like, leave me a comment, let me know what you think. What are your recent failures? Um, how often do you actually blind buy? I'm also curious to know that because I find that this is the practice that is kind of frowned upon within the perfume community, especially by those who've been in this field for years. But I also find that it's kind of like it's an expert bias. It's very hard to acquire deep knowledge of perfumery if you don't have access to um, raw components so you can actually build you know like your library of basics and then understand how those basics are played out in commercial perfumes and it is also hard when a lot of niche brands sell samples instead of giving them away. There are nowhere to try some perfumes that are no longer new, even put for, by designer brands. So blind buying to me, it's almost like the necessary evil um, in, our, in our life as we are at the initial and the middle stages of exploring perfumes. I don't know, that, that, that's at least what I think of it. I wonder what's your opinion. Um, I'll be waiting for your feedback and thank you again so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.